Okay, here's paper three from 2017 for OCR physics. This is the unified physics paper. A stationary uranium-238 nucleus decays into a nucleus of thorium-234 by emitting an alpha particle, chemical symbol is TH, write a nuclear equation for this decay. So we start off with uranium-238, and that's 92, and that decays to thorium and an alpha particle. We know an alpha particle is always four and two, because it's two protons and two neutrons, so four mass altogether. And then it's just a case of maths. Thorium is the atomic number 90, it has to be. 92 is 90 and two. 238 take away four is two, three, four. Couldn't be easier. B, the mass of a uranium nucleus is four times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. After the decay, the thorium nucleus has a speed of 2.4 times 10 to the five meters per second. Calculate the kinetic energy of the alpha particle. Okay, so you might be wondering what on earth do we do here, but we know that at the beginning, the uranium nucleus was stationary. So if we have a thorium nucleus going off on that direction, then we can say that we know we have an alpha particle going off in that direction due to conservation of momentum. So we can say that mtvt, that's the momentum of the thorium nucleus, is equal to m alpha v alpha. Now, okay, technically there should be a minus there, but ultimately it doesn't matter because we're looking for kinetic energy. So we just need the magnitude. Now, here's the sneaky thing is that they've given us the mass of the uranium nucleus, but we need the mass of the thorium nucleus afterwards. So we know that we've gone from uranium-238 to thorium 234 so it isn't going to make a massive difference in the end but we should take that into account anyway so we can say that whatever the mass of the thorium nucleus is afterwards we can say that's 234 238 of that mass times the speed that is equal to and we know an alpha particle is four lots of protons and neutrons so that's four times 1.67 to three six figs minus 27 times its speed. So all we then have to do is tidy this up. And we can see that fours are going to cancel. Let's tidy up powers of 10 as well. So 10 to the minus 25 times 10 to the five, that's gonna be 10 to the minus 20. And then times 10 to the minus 27, let's just put times 10 to the seven on top here. So ultimately the speed of the alpha particle is gonna be 234, this ratio times 2.4 times 10 to the seven divided by 1.67. That gives us 1.41 times 10 to the seven meters per second. Then to find the kinetic energy, we just do half mv squared. It's half times four, and I can cancel that to two times 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 times 1.41 times 10 to the seven squared. That gives me this number here, but I'm looking for mega electron volts. So I have to divide by 1.6 times 10 to the, not minus 19 because that's electron volts, minus 13 for mega electron volts. And that gives me 4.15 mega electron volts. Uranium nucleus starts the decay chain, which ends with a nucleus of lead, 206. Show that 14 particles are emitted during this decay chain. Explain your reasoning. So first of all, we need to get from 238 down to 206. So 238 minus 206 equals 32. And that is equal to how many alpha decays? Well, each alpha decay is for u lost, as it were, for relative atomic mass units lost. So this is going to be eight alpha decays. But then if it's eight alpha decays, that gets us to 206, yes. But it also takes away 16 from here as well, because we're taking away two protons every time. So take away 16, that leaves us with 76. And uh, I don't know what that is, but it doesn't matter. So we're just looking for that, and then we have to get back up to lead, 206 mass doesn't change, but then 82, that means that we have one, two, three, four, five, six beta decays. Therefore, eight alpha plus six beta decays is equal to 14 particles emitted. So always start with alpha decays first to get rid of the mass, because you know that afterwards, when you deal with the beta decays, it's only one thing that's changing. Question two, a small, thin, I think we need a comma in there, boys, 
rectangular slice of semiconducting material has width A and thickness B and carries current I. Current is due to the movement of electrons, the toy. Each electron has charge minus E and mean drift velocity V. Uniform magnetic field of flux density B is perpendicular to the direction of the current and at the top face of the slice is shown. So the current is going that way, fine. Cool, they don't have complicated, don't they? As soon as the current is switched on, the moving electrons in the current are forced towards the shaded rear face of the slice where they are stored. This causes the shaded faces to act like charged parallel plates. Each electron in the current now experiences both electric and magnetic forces. The resultant force on each electron is now zero. Write the expressions for the electric and magnetic forces acting on each electron and use these to show that the magnitude of the potential difference V between the shaded faces is given by V equals BVA. Force on each electron is F BEV due to the magnetic field and due to the electric field it's EE. So if the force is now zero we can say that BEV equals E that cancels. Draw that V a little bit too big there. Okay so we have E equals B. V. Okay, we're almost there. We just need to get rid of the electric field. Now we know an electric field, a setup between two plates, is equal to the PD across the two plates divided by the distance between the plates. And in this case, it's going to be A. Therefore, voltage PD is equal to BVA. Here are some data for the slice in a particular experiment. Oof. Number of conducting electrons per cubic meter is that, and we have our dimensions and current and flux density there. Use this data to calculate the mean drift velocity of electrons within the semiconductor. So we know that current in relation to drift velocity is NAEV, but we're looking for V, so we need to chuck everything over the other side. So we end up with I divided by NAE. So that's just going to be our current, 60 milliamps, so that's 0 0.06 divided by N, which is the density of our electrons, so 1.2 times 10 to the 23 times the area, which is these two here, 5 times 10 to the minus 3 times 2 times 10 to the minus 4, and then finally times the charge of each electron. Good grief, I'm running out of room here. Okay, so let's tidy up powers of 10, shall we? So we have 23 down to 20, down to 16, and then we have minus 19, so it gives us minus three. So let's write it out just nice and neatly. 0 0.06 divided by 1.2 times five times two times 1.6 times 10 to the minus three. So that's just gonna be times by 10. So that's 12 times that. Let's finally put it into our calculator. And that gives us 3.1 meters per second. Calculate the PD between the shaded faces of the slice. Well, we've already been given the equation for this earlier. So BVA, so that's going to be 0 0.08 times 3.1 times 5 times 10 to the minus 3. And that gives us a small PD of 1.2 millivolts. C, the slice is mounted and used as a measuring instrument called a Hall probe. Cell is connected to provide a current in the slice. The PD across the slice is measured by a separate voltmeter. Student wants to measure the magnetic flux density between the poles of two magnet mounted on a steel yoke as shown here. Magnitude of the flux density is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 Tesla. So we have our length here as well. So just one reason why this Hall probe is not a suitable instrument to measure the magnetic flux density for the arrangement shown in figure 2.2. So, bit of a tricky question, but the point is, is that the Hall probe only measures PD. And so it's not easy to convert that back into a flux density for what's going on here. Another method of measuring the magnetic flux density for the arrangement shown is to insert a current carrying wire. Ah, oh, we've seen this before. Explain how the magnetic flux density can be determined using this method and discuss which arrangement in the experiment leads to the greatest uncertainty in the value of the magnetic flux density. So the yoke is placed on balance such that force on it is equal to force on wire running between magnets. F equals B I L, F built. And this is equal to mg, and m is measured on balance. B is obtained from graph of m against i, 
where gradient is equal to B L over G. Change I. Uncertainty comes from measurement of L. That's, that's one thing. There's a couple of things, but let's go with this one. As magnetic field extends past ends of magnets. So we still have a bit of magnetic field coming out here. So even if our wire is going through here, the six centimeters is not going to be completely accurate. Question three, a student is investigating how the discharge of a capacitor through a resistor depends on the resistance of the resistor. Okay, a student charges the capacitor, capacitance C, and discharges it through a resistor, yada, yada. After time 15 seconds, the student records a potential difference across the capacitor. Student repeats the procedure for different values of R. They suggest that V and R are related by the equation this. That is correct. And they put CR instead of RC where V0 is the initial. Okay, student decides to plot a graph of log V, log of the voltage, I can say log, don't have to say LUN, on the Y axis and here's one over R on the X axis to obtain a straight line graph. Show that the magnitude of the gradient is equal to 15 over C. Okay, so here we go. If we have V over V0, this, then that means that log of V over V0 is equal to minus T over RC. But if you know your log identities, you know that the log of a ratio is the log of one, take away the log of the other one. Therefore, log of V is equal to minus T over RC plus log of V zero. And because they're plotting one over R, that means that we can say one over R times 15 over C plus log V zero. Log V zero is the Y intercept, therefore gradient, which is this because this is our X, so this is Y equals MX plus C. Therefore the gradient is equal to minus 15 over C. We are just looking for the magnitude, so it doesn't matter that it's a minus. Values of R and V at 15 seconds are given in the table below. Complete the missing value of log V and its absolute uncertainty in the table above. So let's just have log of V. So log of V gives us 1.098, but we have to round that up to three sig figs. So that's gonna be 1.1, but we have to put the zero in there as well. Plus or minus, now how do we get the uncertainty? So we have to get the percentage uncertainty, so that's 0 0.2 divided by three. So that gives us 0 0.0, well, seven, that's 7%. But then we need to multiply by our value to turn it back into an absolute uncertainty. And that gives us 0 0.07. There you go. Use the data to complete the graph of figure 3.2. Four of the six points have been plotted for you. Okay, so the next one we need to do is 15. So that's 15, that's one over R, but then a log V is 1.31. So 1.3 is there, 1.31 is about there. And our uncertainty is 0 0.06. So each little square here is 0 0.02. So we need to go up three little squares. One, two, three. And down three little squares. One, two, three. And then finally 18, and that's 1.1. 1 .1. 18 is there, 1.1 1 .1 right here, bam. And then we need to go up 0 0.07, so that's three and a half squares. Down three and a half squares. There you go. Use the graph to determine a value for C. Include the absolute uncertainty and an appropriate unit for your answer. Now you can take just a line of best fit, but the way that OCR like you to do it is to actually take both lines of worst fit. Now these really are going to be worst fit because I do not have a long enough ruler. When you do this, you can have a longer ruler. So there's my highest and there is my lowest. Okay, so let's find out my first gradient. So let's pick this point here, 2.06 down to this point, so it's 2.06 take away 1.2 divided by, and that's 17.5 take away three. But we have to be careful because 
this one over r is actually to the power of times 10 to the minus six. So we have to add that on there as well. So 2.06, take away 1.2, divided by 14.5 times 10 to the minus six. That gives us 5.9 times 10 to the four. Let's find out our highest gradient now. So we're going from 2.12 down to, well, should we pick the same point? Yes, why not? Let's go to there as well. So that is 1.08 divided by, again, that 14.5 times 10 to the minus six. So it's gonna be 1.04 divided by 14.5 times 10 to the minus six. That gives us 7.1 times 10 to the four this time. So let's find an average of these two. So 7.1 plus 5.9 divided by two is gonna be 6.5 times 10 to the four, that's our gradient. And let's just find out our percentage uncertainty real quick. So the range 7.1, take away 5.9, so that's 1.2, but we want half the range, so it's gonna be 0 0.6. So 0 0.6 divided by 6.5 times 100, and that'll give us our percentage. That's a percentage error of 9.2%. Okay, so we're gonna use that later. And we saw from earlier that the gradient is equal to minus 15 over C. We don't care about the minus. So therefore, just swapping these two round, we end up with C equals 15 divided by this. And that gives us 2.3 times 10 to the minus four. And it's, that's our value. The unit is farads for capacitance but then we just need to have an absolute uncertainty that's on 9.2%. So let's say 2.3 times 0 0.092, and that gives us 0 0.2. So that's plus or minus 0 0.2, because we can't go to a greater precision than our value with our uncertainty. Mark scheme says plus or minus 0 0.3 times 10 to the minus four farads as the uncertainty. I'm not so sure about that, but there you go. Finally, determine the value of R in kilo-ohms for which the capacitor discharges to 10% of its original potential difference in 15 seconds. So we're looking for 10%, so that's log of V over V0. This is going to be 10%, so that's gonna be log of 0 0.1, and that is equal to minus T over RC, but we're looking for a resistance where this is 15 and the capacitance is 2.3 times 10 to the minus four. So all we have to do is rearrange then. All we have to do is swap these two things over. So we have a resistance equals minus 15 over log of 0 0.1 times 2.3 times 10 to the minus four. Let's do the bottom bit first. Let's do the minus anyway, even though we know it's gonna give us a positive. So that gives us 2.8 times 10 to the four ohms, or in other words, 28 kilo ohms. Four, you were given an unmarked sealed square box which has four identical terminals at each corner. Figure 4.1 shows a circuit diagram for the contents of the box with the four terminals labeled A, B, C, D. One of the resistors in the box has a resistance to 20 ohms. Ooh, it's a puzzle. The other resistor has a resistance 470 ohms. Four terminals on your unmarked sealed box are not labeled. You're given a six volt supply, 100 ohm resistor, labeled R, and a digital ammeter. Plan an experiment to determine the arrangement of the components to identify which terminal of your unmarked seal boxes A, B, C, and D. Okay, so let's find out C and D first, shall we? Attach 100 ohm resistor in series with power supply, and test two terminals until current is... Now, we're trying to find C and D. So if there's no resistance between C and D, then we're looking for, well, 100 ohms and six volts. So we're looking for a current of six over 100. So that's gonna be 0 0.06 amps. If so, terminals are C and D, but you don't know which way around. So we found either C or D. Next thing we wanna do is change the other terminal to A or B reconnect to one other terminal. Now, what are the two options? Well, we have 470 ohms here, or we have 220 ohms here. So let's say that we attach B and C then. Now, whichever one you're connected to here, if you then connect to B, 
you're going to end up with a resistance of just 470 or 220. Let's remove the 100 ohm resistor. So let's say that we have 470 ohms here. So if we attach to B then, then we're looking for a current of 12 milliamps. If I equals 12 milliamps, let's call these R1, R2, R2 is equal to 470 ohms. However, if it's 220, it's going to be equals to 28 milliamps. Terminal is B. What's the overall resistance going to be? It's going to be 690. So if we have a resistance of 690, then we're going to have 9 milliamps. If the current is 9 milliamps, connected to A and C or D. B, light dependent resistor is connected between points X and Y in the circuit. The circuit is used to switch on a lamp during the hours of darkness. Sounds very ominous. Draw the symbol for an LDR on figure 4.2 between X and Y. It's just a resistor with two little arrows going in. Sometimes you might see a circle around it. You don't have to have the circle. Figure 4.3 shows how resistance of LDR varies with light intensity. The electron switches when V across XY is 4 volts and opens when V across XY is 2.4 volts. The electronic switch draws a negligible current. So calculate the resistance R of the resistor for the lamp to switch on at an intensity of 0 0.8 watts per meter squared. Okay, so at 0 0.8, we are looking at a resistance across the LDR of exactly three kilo ohms. Isn't that convenient? So the resistance of the LDR is gonna be 3000 ohms. And in order to switch on, if we want the lamp to switch on, that means we're looking for this four volts. So fairly easy, just the ratio game. So if we have four volts across here, that means that it's taking two thirds of the six volts. That means that this is two thirds of the overall resistance. So therefore this is going to be 1.5 kilo ohms. Okay, let's just prove it mathematically as well. So we know the ratio of the voltages is gonna be equal to the ratio of the resistances. We're looking for that. So rearranging all of this, we have VR, RLDR, divided by VLDR. So that ends up being, well, it's gonna be two because four is taken up by this. So this has to be two volts. Two times 3000 divided by four. So you can see ultimately it's half of 3,000. So it's 1.5 kilo ohms or 1,500 ohms. Ooh, look at that. They've been really cheeky by putting ohms in there, not kilo ohms. Beggars. What about the light intensity of the surroundings at which the lamp switches off? So this is staying at 1.5 kilo ohms, but now we have 2.4 volts across the LDR. So let's use this again, but this time we're looking for the resistance of the LDR. So R of the LDR equal to V LDR times the resistance of the resistor divided by voltage across said resistor. So that's going to be 2.4 times 1,500 divided by the voltage over the resistor. Now it's 2.4 here. So that means that we have to have 3.6 here to add up to six volts altogether. And that gives us 1,000 ohms or one kilo ohm. Okay, so one kilo ohm, ba, 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 ba. that gets us to right here. So that's 2.4 watts per meter squared. Vision five, loudspeaker mounted on a bench is emitting sound of frequency 1.7 kilohertz to a microphone. Figure 5.1 shows an illustration of both movement of the air at one instant of time. Maximum displacement of the air is that. Speed of sound is that. On figure 5.2, sketch a sinusoidal variation of the displacement of the air with distance between C and R. Okay, so we have a compression, C, and a rarefaction, R. And uh, we can see that we have a compression there as well. So we've gone through one and a half wavelengths. What is the wavelength though? Well, V equals F lambda or C equals F lambda. We're looking for lambda. So that's gonna be V over F, so that's 340 divided by 1,700, and so ultimately that's gonna be 34 divided by 170. I can see that's going to be two over 10. That's gonna be 0 0.2 meters. So we have a wavelength of 0 0.2 meters and we wanna fit in one and a half wavelengths. So why don't we go with that? So let's go with 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 0 0.11, 0 0.12, 0
0 0.2, 0 0.3. That's our wavelength in meters. What about our y-axis? We're going up to two times 10 to the minus six meters. So let's just go one, two, minus one, minus two. And that's, uh, let's go D in, I'll put a slash this time, times 10 to the minus six meters. So number one, label the axes and include sensible scales, done that. Uh, first of all, we need to have a compression. So we're starting at a maximum and then we're going one wavelength. So we need to end up back up here and then uh, back at a rarefaction here. So our wave is going to look like this. We need to make sure it crosses these points here as well. A little bit of a spiky wave I've got going on there, but it's not too bad. I haven't gone right down to the bottom there. On figure 5.2, mark one point where air particles are moving at maximum speed. Label it X. Well, we know that this is effectively SHM, and so therefore it's at equilibrium where they are moving the fastest. Uh, mark one point where the air particles are moving at maximum speed, opposite direction, label it Y. So that's going to be here. Calculate the maximum speed V max of the oscillating particles in the sound wave. So this is SHM, here we go. So we have V max is equal to two pi F A. Speed is two pi F root A squared minus X squared, but if we're looking for V max, it's just this. So that's two pi times 1,700 times our amplitude, which is two times 10 to the minus six. So that gives us 2.1 times 10 to the minus two meters per second. Calculate the root mean square speed, CRMS, of the air molecules in the room. Well, the mass of the air is 2.9 times 10 to the minus two kilograms per mole. So this is kinetic theory. We know that half mv squared, we're just going to call it v instead of crms to keep things simple. That is equal to three halves kt. But we haven't been given the mass of one molecule. We've been given the mass of a whole mole. So what we can do is say half big M, that's the mass of a mole, v squared equals three halves, not kt, but rt instead. So getting rid of the halves, we end up with v equals the square root of three RT over the molar mass. So that's three times 8.31 times the temperature. It can't be in degrees C, it has to be Kelvin. So that's 273 plus 17. So that's 290 Kelvin divided by the molar mass, 2.9 times 10 to the minus two. And that gives us a nice round number of 500 meters per second. So just so you're aware that yes, kinetic energy of one molecule is half mv squared equals three halves kt. But if you are given the mass of a whole mole, then you can just use three halves rt instead. Students are given the equipment together with the meter rule. They're also given a second loudspeaker connected to the same signal generator at 1.7 kilohertz. They asked to design an experiment where they would need to take just one measurement and be able to determine the value of the speed of sound. They set up the experiment in two different ways as shown in figure 5.3 and B. Method A, the microphone is fixed and one loudspeaker is moved to the left as shown in figure 5.3. In method B, the microphone is moved to the left or the right with the loudspeakers fixed a certain distance apart as shown here. Describe and explain how both methods can be used to accurately determine the speed of sound. In your description, discuss how the uncertainty in the value for the speed of sound can be minimized in one of the methods without using any other apparatus. So in both experiments, microphone is used to detect maxima and minima, i.e constructive destructive interference. In A, every time maximum is detected, speaker has moved one wavelength, lambda. That's because if we have a speaker producing a wave here, we need other speaker to be producing a sound which ends up being in phase when it reaches the other loudspeaker. So it only works every wavelength, can't be half a wavelength, can't be anything else. In B, however, because if you're moving to the right, you're moving further away from this one, but you're moving closer to this one, it means that every time a maximum is detected, this time, microphone has moved half a wavelength. So what could you do to reduce uncertainty? 
you can first of all use a lower frequency to reduce percentage uncertainty measured wavelength. Could also detect minima too to obtain more readings. What else is gonna happen? Well, you're gonna have reflections of some other things in the room maybe. Remove, reduce reflections from other surfaces. Last question, question six. Question is about the motion of a ball suspended by an elastic string above a bench. Master string is negligible compared to that of the ball. Ignore air resistance. Figure 6.1, the ball of weight 1.2 newtons. Hangs vertically at rest. Extension of the string is that. The string obeys Hooke's law. What a good string. Figure 6.2, the ball is moving in a horizontal circle of radius 0.045 meters around vertical axis P, period 0.67 seconds. The string is at an angle theta to the vertical, the tension of the string is T. And figure 6.2, drawn label one of the force acting on the ball. Of course, we have our weight. Resolve the tension T horizontally and vertically to show that the angle theta is 22 degrees. Okay, so we're looking for this. And we have this, and we know we have a centripetal force that's a component of the tension pulling inwards. So the tension is providing an upwards force of 1.2 newtons in order to balance the weight. And we have this centripetal force pulling in like that. So we have this force pulling in is a centripetal force. So this is circular motion. We can say it's mv squared over r, or we can say it's m omega squared r. Let's go with omega squared r. And of course that is equal to m times two pi f squared r, but we have the time period. So we're instead going to call that, uh, let's just stick with mr times two pi over t squared. Okay, so this mass is obviously going to be 1.2 divided by 9.8 as well. So let's pop that all into our calculator. 1.2 divided by 9.8 times the radius of our circle times 4 pi squared, let's just square it all in one go, divided by 0 0.67 squared. That gives us a force of 0 0.48 newtons. We're looking for this angle here, so it's going to be the inverse tan of 0 0.48 divided by 1.2, and that gives us 22 degrees, like they said. And then we want to find T. We can use any of these now. Let's go with turning through the angle here, turning through the angle here. So that's going to be 1.2 divided by cos 22, turning through the angle is cos. If you don't know where I got that from, have a look at my easy vectors trick video. And that gives us 1.3 Newtons. Calculate the extension X of the string shown in figure 6.2. Okay, so with just 1.2 Newtons, we had an extension of that. So we know that force is proportional to extension. So we can say that F1 over extension one equals force two over extension two. We're looking for extension two. So let's just flip everything on its head. We end up with X2 equals the X1, F2 over F1, so 0.05 times 1.3 divided by 1.2. That gives us 0 0.054 meters. See, whilst rotating in the horizontal plane, the ball suddenly becomes detached from the string. The bottom of the ball is 0.18 meters above the bench at this instant. The ball falls as a projectile towards the bench beneath. Figure 6.3 shows the view from above. Okay, we've got to calculate the horizontal distance R from the point on the bench vertically below the point P to the point where the ball lands on the bench. Oh boy, right. We're looking for this distance here, so we need to use SUVAT. We need to find out how long it takes to reach the ground, first of all. So we're looking for that. Acceleration is 9.8. Initial speed is zero, because it is just going horizontally in a circle. And it's 0 0.18 meters above the bench. So S equals UT plus half ET squared. UT ends up being zero. Therefore, the time is going to be the square root of 2s over a, square root of 0 0.36 divided by 9.8, so that's 0 0.19 seconds. Okay, we have the time taken to reach the ground. Next thing we need to know is how fast is it going horizontally? Well, we get that from our circular motion, don't we? 
we saw that the time period is 0.67 seconds. And so we can say we know that V equals omega R. So a little equation that people often forget. Linear speed is equal to angular speed times the radius. So that's two pi F R. But we don't have F, we have time period says so two pi R over the time period. So that's two pi times 0 0.045, that's the radius of the path here, divided by 0 0.67 gives us 0 0.42 meters per second. Therefore, if it's flying at 0 0.42 meters per second this way, and it flies for 0 0.19 seconds, all we have to do is find out the distance. Distance is speed times time, so both of these times together. That gives us 0 0.08 meters. But I missed out the last bit because if this here is 0 0.08 meters, but then we have that, we're looking for the hypotenuse. So this distance is equal to the square root of that 0 0.45 squared plus 0 0.08 squared. And the final answer is 0 0.092 meters. Finally, returning to the situation shown in 6.2, Stain explain what happens when the rate of rotation of the ball is increased. Two things happen. You know that if you spin something faster, then that means that this is going to fly upwards more. So as the angle is going to increase, theta will increase. What else will increase? Well, T will increase. And of course, if the tension increases, then the extension will too. We can say due to larger centripetal force. Oops, can't spell. There you go. So hope you found this helpful. Please leave a like if it did. And if you want to see any other past paper videos that I've done, check out my channel and I'll see you there.